Welcome to the Morrison Family Pavilion at ND Leaf. Here, we conduct research that informs land and water management. Aquatic ecosystems, including lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands, provide important services to everyone on the planet. In addition to providing clean water for drinking, freshwater ecosystems also provide water for irrigation of crops and for recreation. Aquatic ecosystems also support a wide range of amazing aquatic animals and plants. Whole food webs are supported by clean water. Unfortunately, humans are impacting these aquatic ecosystems and reducing their ability to perform these important functions. We can negatively affect aquatic biota through the construction of dams, removal of nearshore vegetation, and large woody debris. The overharvest of top predators, like fish, can cause large shifts in aquatic food webs which can impact water quality. These are called top-down effects because they start at the top of the food web and move down. Changes can also occur from the bottom up in a process known as eutrophication. In this process, excess nutrients, usually phosphorus and nitrogen, stimulate aquatic plant growth. Just like your car or smartphone, all living things require energy to operate. In the case of plants and animals, they need energy to grow and thrive. For example, plants use energy to synthesize more biomass. Warm-blooded animals use energy to heat their bodies, sense their environment, and do physical work. The process in which organisms use energy to do these things is called respiration. Through respiration, the simple sugar glucose is converted to carbon dioxide and water, and in turn, energy is released. So to simplify, the process of respiration uses oxygen and releases carbon dioxide. But where does all this energy come from? And where does it go? All the energy in aquatic food webs originates from the sun. Through the process of photosynthesis, the energy from the sunlight is converted to chemical energy to be used first by plants. Generally speaking, in aquatic systems, the primary producers, or autotrophs, are plants and algae. When plants and algae convert sunlight to chemical energy, they also release oxygen as a byproduct. This oxygen is essential for life on Earth. It's the essential part of the air we breathe. Photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide and releases oxygen, so it is the opposite of respiration. Once energy has been captured by plants and algae, it is transferred through the food chain through direct consumption by getting eaten. One example of a simple food web, a food chain really, is when algae is consumed by small larval insects that eat it by scraping it off of rocks, such as this caddisfly. This insect may then be consumed by a different predatory insect, the dragonfly larvae, and then the dragonfly may be eaten by a fish. Often, aquatic food chains end outside the water by top consumers. For example, that fish may be eaten by an eagle, a bear, or even a person. If we expand our single food chain to the entire system, we get a food web. In reality, that caddisfly may have been eaten directly by a fish or hashed and eaten by a bird. And the dragonfly larva may have actually eaten a small fish. As you can see, a food web more accurately describes how species interact. As we mentioned before, all of these plants and animals in the food web are constantly respiring, and the primary producers are also photosynthesizing. We refer to the net sum of all the respiration and all the photosynthesis in a body of water as ecosystem metabolism. But why is metabolism important? And how can scientists use it to better understand how streams and lakes function? Just like a doctor measures the vitals of a patient, such as blood pressure, temperature, and pulse, 
Aquatic ecologists can measure the vital signs of aquatic ecosystems using functional metrics. One commonly measured metric in aquatic ecosystems is metabolism of the whole system. By measuring the metabolism of the water body, ecologists are able to better understand how the system is functioning as a whole, a snapshot of the well-being of all the organisms contained within it. As we have learned, both respiration and photosynthesis influence the amount of dissolved oxygen gas in water. Remember, photosynthesis produces oxygen and respiration uses oxygen. So the oxygen we measure in the water reflects the balance of these two processes. If we look at a graph of oxygen produced by plants, we see it peaks during the day and decreases at night. Respiration, on the other hand, stays relatively constant throughout the day because living organisms are constantly respiring. If we take the sum of these two and look at how oxygen levels change over time, we can see that the level of oxygen increases and decreases in a diel, or daily, pattern. These oxygen swings can be influenced by other external environmental factors. For example, physical aeration, like here at the ND Lee Supply Well, can change oxygen levels. So can runoff and nutrient additions to aquatic systems. One common issue in freshwater ecosystems is the presence of excess nutrients, usually as phosphorus or nitrogen. These nutrients can get washed into streams and lakes from the surrounding land. Excess nutrients can come from runoff from residential lawns, agricultural fields, or from large rain events which cause municipal wastewater systems to discharge raw sewage into our waterways. Excess nutrient delivery causes the process of eutrophication. Because plants and algae utilize nutrients in order to grow, it allows them to increase in number and size. Thus, excess nutrients also increase photosynthesis and oxygen production. Excess oxygen in an aquatic environment may sound like a good thing, but the increased biomass of plants and algae and the decomposition of dead biomass after they die increases respiration of the ecosystem. This leads to large swings in dissolved oxygen throughout the day that can stress living organisms. Furthermore, eutrophic systems can also experience prolonged low oxygen conditions in the winter when much of the plant life dies and begins to decompose. These decreases in oxygen can cause lake-wide fish kills, which can be common events during certain times of the year. For example, every year in the Gulf of Mexico, a large dead zone forms. This is caused by nitrogen runoff from Midwestern states entering the Mississippi River, which stimulates primary production in the Gulf of Mexico. When the algal bloom dies, it eventually leads to hypoxic or low oxygen area, reducing the number of fish and shellfish. This has a large economic impact on the local economy. In contrast, low nutrient, or what we call oligotrophic systems, do not exhibit these large swings in daily or seasonal dissolved oxygen. They provide a more stable environment for aquatic life to flourish. By measuring the dissolved oxygen throughout the day, usually using environmental sensors, ecologists can get a better understanding of the nutrient landscape of these systems and how the water chemistry may vary from day to day, month to month, and season to season. In this way, we are able to get a read on the health of aquatic ecosystems. Is there anything we can do to decrease the amount of excess nutrients flowing into our streams and lakes? Yes. At home, make sure to only fertilize your lawns as needed, or not at all. And don't fertilize if rain is likely. Wait instead to avoid runoff. 
farmers are minimizing nutrient runoff from fields by planting cover crops in the winter to keep bare soil covered. They can also keep their livestock and their livestock's waste from entering nearby streams and ditches. Cities are also making innovations to limit the discharge of raw sewage into our waterways by improving their sewer systems and avoiding combined sewer overflows, or CSOs. As you can see, the eutrophication of our lakes and streams is a serious issue. But with improved land and water management strategies fueled by solution-driven research, it's a problem that we believe we can tackle. At ND Leaf, researchers are investigating how to manage streams to retain more nutrients, to be better sponges, if you will, and in this way, preventing excess nutrients from moving downstream. Thanks for learning about aquatic ecosystems with us and... Go, Go Irish! Irish.